Welcome to this morning's American Security Project webinar. This is an on the record conversation that will be available for attribution. A recording of this conversation will be posted on our website and sent to those who registered for the event. All audience members will be muted during the discussion, but please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions to the panelists. With that, Patrick Costello, over to you. Great, thank you, Annie. Good morning, everyone. I'm Patrick Costello, the CEO of the American Security Project. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual meeting. Over the last few weeks, we're all closely watching the UN Climate Conference in Glasgow. And now that COP26 is concluded, we're trying to make sense of it all. Uh, we must look at the commitments made and ask how we ensure implementation of pledges and create accountability. At the conference, UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez said, we're still knocking on the door of climate catastrophe and it's time to go into emergency mode. So perhaps most critically, we must ask if the pledges go far enough to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. I'm thrilled to be joined this morning by Sherry Goodman, Scott Moore, and Robert Orr. As Annie mentioned, this conversation is on the record and will be recorded. Sherry, Robert, and Scott are going to provide some brief opening comments to frame this morning's conversation before we open it up to our guests on the line for their questions. Again, when we get to that point, please use the Q&A function to pose your questions. By way of background, Sherry is a senior fellow at the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program and Polar Institute. She's also Secretary General of the International Military Council on Climate and Security. Sherry is a real trailblazer in the climate security field and the nexus between climate change and national security. Robert is currently the Dean of the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland, go Terps. Um, formerly, he served as the UN Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Strategic Planning within the Executive Office of the Secretary General. In that role, he served as the Principal Advisor to the Secretary General on a range of issues, including sustainable energy, food and nutrition, and climate change. And finally, we're joined by Scott Moore. Scott is the Director of the China Programs and Strategic Initiatives at Penn Global. Scott's research and commentary on a wide range of environmental and international affairs issues has appeared in a number of leading scholarly journals and media outlets. Uh, Scott has also worked on environmental sustainability and emerging technology issues at the State Department and the World Bank. Sherry's going to start us off by providing an overview of what was accomplished in Glasgow. We'll then turn to Robert, uh, who will provide a look ahead at the next steps in climate diplomacy. And then Scott will provide a deeper dive on China's climate policy and the somewhat unexpected US-China declaration that vowed to boost climate cooperation. So all those preliminaries out of the way, thank you for joining us. Sherry, I'll yield the floor to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. It's a pleasure to be here with the other distinguished panelists. And I wanna start out by welcoming you to the helm of the American Security Project. Uh, it's a, a very um, auspicious moment uh, for you personally and for the organization, for its bipartisan roots, its focus on security. And I, I will also say for this moment related to climate and security, because it, I think in many ways, the COP marks for me, um, the, main, the full on mainstreaming of climate change into foreign policy and national security decision-making in a way we haven't seen before. It, it represents in many ways a paradigm shift. I'm gonna to come to the specifics of what was achieved or not achieved at the COP in a moment, but I wanna mark this, particularly knowing Patrick, that you came from the Council on Foreign Relations, which in many ways is a, the sort of pillar of establishment foreign policy in the United States and sort of a barometer of how, um, of, of the importance and the values and, and the issue set at the center of foreign policy in the United States. And um, maybe because I watch too much um, morning TV when I'm making my coffee, you know, I sometimes see Richard Haas, the president on MSNBC. And, you know, he has been talking a lot about climate change lately. And he's been talking about it as at the center of our foreign policy decision-making in a way um, and, and I think we see this, of course, the Biden administration said that it was going to be central to its decision-making, uh, and it has been. 
but we see this um, becoming even, we, we see this now in its full fruition that it affects um, not just the particulars of how we, what the terms are of um, coal phase down or phase out or deforestation or methane commitments. Those are all vitally important to the existential threat of climate change, but it affects every other geopolitical relationship we have. And that's why Scott's gonna talk about the China relationship. So um, I, I think this is marks um, a recognition that actorless threats like climate change, like the pandemic are now at the heart of um, our international relations and that while states still govern it, uh, and as we saw at Glasgow, this is one of the other very notable moments. States are still in the driver's seat, 192 of them. People complain how cumbersome that is and that doesn't make for good. You know, oh, we liked it better when we could just negotiate with the Russians on arms control because at least, you know, we had more control. Um, and this is very messy, but it is, it is the world we live in. It's the nature of the threats, the threat multiplier of climate change. And it's the fact that there are many more powerful actors in the system now, from the private sector to the youth movements, to NGOs, um, to non-state actors. And I think we have to recognize how diffuse, and subnational as well, how diffuse power has become uh, in this um, uh, globalized, some would say, I mean, I am Marie Slaughter's calling it globalism, um, there's different frames on it, but whether you're a more realpolitik person or you want to uh, put individuals at the center or states, I think there's no doubt that climate change is at the center of uh, the mainstream, the most existential threats we face. We live it now every day. That was abundantly clear at COP, which is why um, the urgency uh, for action is so great and why, why we may not be able to act beyond at the rate at which the chain, climate change is occurring. We see that already. So the major agreement, you know, there was high climate ambition going into it. The U.S. declared itself back under the Biden administration. The EU was strongly moving ahead, as were many of our other allies. There were good, good global commitments on reducing methane, um, on, on deforestation, although the transparency of it and the tracking of it is still not clear and Bolsonaro in Brazil is not certainly not all in on it. Um, uh, I think we reached a high point with attention to phasing, to, to some f recognition that fossil fuels have to be on the way out. The pace is not agreed. Uh, we, you know, even if we stop um, financing the export of coal, we're still going to be producing countries like India, Australia, China, even the U.S. still all producing coal for some period of time. But we are, we, we did see, I think, also what was notable, partly in the critiques of the youth and the NGOs about the presence of uh, private sector investment capital, private sector money uh, at this is that you see there's money to be made in the energy and climate transition. And that's important. I mean, there's a negative downside on that, but there's the positive that that marks the transformation of our global economies. Um, now, many of us here on this call, you know, on the line today, we spent a lot of time talking about the nexus of climate and security. I love to talk about that. Um, I've spent a lot of my life on that. I think we reached a high water mark, you know, in uh, the national secure among national security professionals in attention to this. The work is ongoing. The Biden administration has very ambitious executive orders. The Department of Defense and the IC and the other agencies have all put out very strong, compelling documents in the last month or two, a climate adaptation plan from all the federal agencies. The DOD one, I think, is particularly good uh, and forward-leaning. The climate risk analysis, the first national intelligence estimate on climate change, um, They've all, um, you know, they've they've all moved the ball further down the field on understanding the nexus of climate and security, on uh, uh, defining the problem more sharply, on moving forward with institutionalizing the responses with climate literacy across the federal agencies, with ramping up uh, education and training, with taking analysis, as we say, to action in sort of a bet embedding both resilience activities across the Department of Defense from bases to troops to transforming our how we use energy in the Department of Defense, but also the geopolitical approach to our COCOMs, 
uh, in our theater, our regional approaches, I think you'll see uh, a whole lot of movement um, in, the, in the coming years. And uh, that is all, um, I'd say that's, that's all very positive. Um, you know, the challenge is that climate change continues to outpace our ability to respond and, and catch up to it, to either mitigate or become resilient. When you see the rapid changing of the Arctic two to three times uh, higher than uh, global average, retreating sea ice, rising temperatures and thawing permafrost, um, there's a lot to keep us up at night uh, to be concerned about. But nonetheless, I am uh, I'm pleased with the progress we've made and um, I will, I'll, I'll, let, I'll stop my opening remarks at this point, Patrick. Great, no, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sherry. We can certainly dive deeper into some of those, uh, some of those wave tops you hit during the q and I'll now toss it over to Robert. Robert, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Patrick. And it's great to uh, hear Sherry kick us off with a, a very, I think, uh, accurate and precise frame about where we are on this. And, and I couldn't agree more with her that climate change policy is at this point economic policy. It is security policy. It is geopolitical policy. The, the days of climate change and addressing climate change being handled over on one side of the government or one side of the international uh, regime is long over. And so having these kind of discussions with the, uh, not only the affected constituencies, but the constituencies that do play into uh, the policy regime around climate and around security is very timely. Um, you might not be surprised to hear a, a longtime organizer of global summits uh, during my time in the US government and the UN uh, say that global summits uh, don't solve a problem like climate change, uh, but they do focus the mind and they focus the institutional minds as well as the individual minds. And I think uh, despite all of the, the heated rhetoric and the, the kind of pronouncements about Glasgow, you know, keeping 1.5 alive, but only barely. These kind of uh, summaries uh, really obscure more than they illuminate. Uh, the fact is that the Glasgow summit is part of a uh, ongoing process of uh, the climate regime that was crafted in Paris and agreed uh, back in 2015 um, this, in, this process uh, moves on year after year, both in the international negotiation space, but also in the real world marketplace. Um, and I think uh, Glasgow was important as the identified point after the Paris Agreement, where the world's governments were supposed to come back together, um, assess how they were doing on ambition, and use the agreed ratchet mechanism to increase ambition of all parties to the Paris Agreement. And uh, I think the, the quick takeaway on, on Glasgow for me is that the ratchet mechanism was partially successful. It did uh, this focus on, on Glasgow and keeping 1.5 alive did get a number of governments to run their processes look at their nationally determined contributions and tighten the ratchet a bit. Um, a, we've recently at the University of Maryland, along with uh, the, universe, or the US Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Lab, done a recent uh, study on all of the commitments. And I think, um, uh, Patrick, maybe if we could drop into the chat, the. Uh, the article that was in Science Magazine uh, just a, a week or two ago, the numbers are uh, sobering that at the time of the Paris Agreement, um, there, the commitments made by the parties in Paris had an 8% chance of limiting uh, global warming to under two degrees Celsius, um, uh, the increases to two degrees Celsius and a 0% chance of limiting it to 1.5. Uh, 
under the new set of commitments that came out uh, in anticipation of Glasgow and in Glasgow, uh, those numbers have gone up uh, to, uh, let me just get my most recent numbers here. They've gone up to 34% chance of keeping under two degrees and a 1.5% chance of keeping under 1.5 degrees. Uh, still not terribly encouraging numbers. There are, however, a number of uh, 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 quasi commitments and things that were um, pledged in Glasgow that have a more robust um, uh, kind of trajectory that would uh, have us heading towards a 60% chance of staying under two degrees if these commitments are all met or an 11% of staying under 1.5. So still sobering numbers, but it does show that the ratchet mechanism is working, even if not fast enough, even if not dramatically enough, the increases in ambition pledged are moving us towards higher percentage chance of keeping the warming from uh, catastrophic uh, levels. Um, that may not sound like uh, great progress, but it is at least progress in the right direction. Um, the, where are we headed from here? So if Glasgow is not you know, the summit to end all summits, um, the process continues. And it was agreed in Glasgow that the countries, the parties to the Paris Agreement would come together next year in Egypt and that they would uh, re-evaluate uh, and push this ratchet mechanism yet again to try to get more ambition out of the same parties that came to Glasgow. Uh, and here, uh, we can be pretty explicit about this, especially those large parties that did not increase their ambition coming to Glasgow. China is uh, the kind of headliner here, India in close second place, um, there is a need for uh, keeping the pressure on the large emitting uh, parties to make sure that they continue to tighten their ratchet mechanisms. And for various reasons of internal politics, which are a given in every country, um, the timing of different summits uh, on the international stage don't always correspond to where things are at, at a, any given national level. So in constantly giving the opportunity for countries to tighten their own ratchet mechanism and, uh, and be more ambitious on their climate targets is what we will see in, in Egypt next year. Um, and I think that's important for improving those numbers that I just gave you on, on the percentage chances of staying under two degrees rise and under 1.5. The other major part of the next stage of this process is to get into the real implementation of all these pledges and the new pledges that would be uh, sought in Egypt. Um, and here, the, the uh, showing at Glasgow was very strong. Uh, I think you, you mobilize the range of actors in uh, a COP setting like Glasgow that uh, have real equities in the marketplace. And they do want to know what the governments are saying, what they're committing, um, and what they're leveraging. But uh, the range of private actors mobilized ahead of Glasgow was quite impressive. And it continues the tradition of what we did in Paris and, and before Paris. Um, the implementation coalitions are getting thicker, they're getting stronger, and they are getting stuff done. The, the biggest uh, kind of headline commitment, and Sherry mentioned the methane coalition and the deforestation coalition, these are major. They're really important to get those actors constantly meeting, constantly uh, showing what they're doing and not doing, and then uh, uh, doing more. But the, the biggest uh, kind of headline coming out of, uh, of Glasgow for me was the mobilization of the private finance coalition. And Mark Carney, uh, former uh, Bank of England governor, um, 
uh, really help to uh, pull together all of the private uh, asset holders and asset managers, uh, banks, insurance companies, um, uh, various investment uh, funds to align their portfolios with uh, net zero by 2050. And uh, $130 trillion of assets and people have taken issue with, is this the right calculation? Is it 100 or 130? But uh, representatives of asset holders of uh, over $130 trillion of assets uh, aligned formally this, or committed to align their portfolios with a net zero trajectory by 2050. Um, it is pointed out by many that currently those same asset holders that the 130 represent, you know, their current alignment with that is probably under about a third of that. Um, so when their commitment is to align their entire portfolios, that's a huge shift of capital that is projected under that. I say this not to, to say that we need to take all these pledges at face value, but rather to show where the marketplace is moving. Uh, the signals sent to the marketplace by these holders of capital can't be ignored. So it's not just the signals that the government sent in Glasgow, it is the signals that private asset holders are sending. And believe me, corporate boardrooms all over the world that depend on all this private capital uh, got the message loud and clear. And therefore, you will see in the coming years a level of change in the corporate space, uh, in the industrial space, in the agriculture space, in the transportation space, because they are chasing this money. That alignment is not a theoretical alignment. It's how these massive private portfolios allocate their funds will determine who gets them. So I think that is for me, the, the real test in the, the coming year is not just what happens in the diplomatic negotiations and the states further tightening their, or raising their ambition and tightening the ratchet mechanism, but it's the implementation by all of these grand coalitions that showed up in Glasgow. Um, and I think that is, is maybe uh, one of the most prominent is those private asset holders. The one other thing that I wanted to flag for everyone is the importance of the implementation model. These are, as Sherry pointed out, a, you know, it, it's a, it may feel like a throwback to have 192 governments meet to talk about this problem when all of the, the real implementation is happening by a much broader set of actors. But it is, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it is very clear that climate action doesn't just happen from national governments. It happens from local and state governments. It happens from businesses and nonprofits. It happens from universities. And, you know, we, we take decisions on our little cities that are called universities. Um, and this is going into all of our planning. So the kind of things we do in the academic sector are being replicated in all these others. Um, I, I wanted to see if you could drop into the chat the, the document that I, I forwarded about uh, America is All In is a coalition that was formed uh, after the Trump administration uh, withdrew from the Paris Agreement or stated its intent to withdraw back in, in 2017. Um, the America is All In Coalition was originally a sign up of local governments and states and businesses, and it created a bottom up measurable set of commitments by actors in the US economy um, that it was essentially the pledges that weren't coming at the national level in the US, but coming from all of the creators of greenhouse gases and the managers of greenhouse gases. And this kind of analysis uh, has been really uh, perfected over the last uh, four or five years, such that we can now measure bottom up climate pledges in a much more precise way than we could even three or four years ago. And this America's All In report that, that I've asked to just be dropped in the chat 
gives you a very clear picture of how the Biden administration actually uh, arrived at its 50 to 52 percent reduction target by 2030. It shows who has to reduce how much and who has committed to reduce how much as to how you can get there. So this bottom-up climate action and bottom-up climate pledging is a whole new side of the equation that we have here, in addition to the nation-state-led uh, pledging and action. And I think it's very exciting to see what's happening, not just in this country, but uh, I will say this bottom-up climate action represented by the America's All-In Coalition uh, is being uh, uh, disseminated to other countries as well, when not just those countries where the national politics have gone sideways, um, think of the Brazils here, uh, but also in countries like China and India and Indonesia that uh, where you know, the top-down uh, pronouncements uh, now have constituencies building this bottom-up model. So I think the, the in Egypt, we'll continue to see these coalitions coming together to try to operationalize pledges. We'll also see more bottom-up pledging, and that will help to continue to spur the, the engine that we need of uh, increased ambition. But uh, it, it's, you know, the glass really is half full. I think John Kerry was not just spinning it diplomatically when he said, look, every one of these negotiations, you come out and the glass is either half full, half empty, or some percentage. Um, I think it is half full in that the, the one thing that Glasgow most certainly did was it reassembled a global coalition addressing climate change that had frayed quite significantly over the last four years. So now we're gonna see how this global coalition performs in the, the year and the years ahead. Great. Thank you very much, Robert. That was a fantastic overview of what, uh, what to look forward to uh, looking ahead. Uh, Scott, over to you. Actually, I should note to our uh, guests on the line, we have dropped a number of resources in the chat function. We will also make sure to include those in the event recap that we send around. Scott, over to you. Thanks, Patrick, and thanks to you all for joining. I'm uh, excited to get to the, the discussion phase, so I'll try to be uh, relatively brief here. Um, I, I can't resist, you know, my brief is to, to talk about China, but I can't resist just a quick um, overview comment on the big picture here. And it really underscores things that both Sherry and uh, Bob said. Um, folks, we got some good news and we got some bad news. Um, the good news is really on the technological front um, that we had confirmation actually shortly before the COP in the form of a, a landmark uh, IEA report um, that renewable energy, uh, particularly solar PV at the utility scale and uh, wind power, uh, has basically scaled faster than essentially any other technology in history. Um, uh, and that costs have fallen uh, considerably faster uh, than even uh, the IEA estimated a year ago. Um, that's the really good news. Um, the really bad news is on the climactic front. Uh, as again, Sherry and, and Bob both highlighted um, we're seeing really uh, much more rapid uh, and large scale climate effects than uh, we thought even uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, and increasingly, we seem to be headed for uh, nonlinear effects where we can expect uh, these things to happen uh, you know, with more frequency and to sort of unleash uh, cycles of climactic responses um, that we see in the geologic record. And, and frankly, it's pretty terrifying. So the question that, that's now in front of us um, is where are these lines gonna cross uh, in terms of rapidly falling uh, costs for renewable energy and other clean technologies um, versus rapidly increasing uh, uh, and uh, uh, increasingly intense climate effects. Uh, and what I will say about China uh, is that uh, China really stands at the center and will determine uh, much of how uh, both of those trend lines uh, end up sloping. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about China's uh, climate policy, the role that China has played in the multilateral climate talks and in U.S.-China relations more broadly. Um, what I would say is my, my thoughts on both of those uh, kind of segments are under the general headline of defying the skeptics so far. Uh, and I'll get into why uh, I wouldn't uh, quite be ready to hang up my skepticism um, quite yet. Um, so when it comes to China's climate policy um, in particular, I think the, the crucial point here, and it actually parallels what Sherry was saying about the increasing centrality of climate 
uh, in international security and diplomacy and international relations and in geopolitics, uh, climate change and, and energy issues have really become pretty central and fundamental uh, to China's overall economic development and growth strategy, as well as increasingly uh, to its foreign policy. Um, and there are three uh, kind of quick phases I want to point to in terms of the evolution of China's climate policy that I think uh, show that. The first is if you had, uh, if we had been having this discussion prior to 2020, um, what I would have said about China and climate change um, is that China had arguably the most ambitious set of uh, commitments, of climate commitments uh, of any developing economy. Um, and yet uh, the scale of those commitments really fell far short of what the world just from a climactic perspective needed China to do. And in particular, uh, China had at that point not committed to doing anything more than peaking its emissions, um, which is to say to stop increasing um, as opposed to um, reducing in absolute terms. Then uh, flash forward to September 2020, uh, Xi Jinping stood before the UN General Assembly and to most everyone's surprise, uh, committed China to uh, achieving net zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2060. Um, so really the first time any uh, economy uh, as large um, and diversified as China's had made anything you know, kind of close to that, uh, ambitious of a commitment quickly followed by Japan. Um, and then later on, you know, uh, this year by, by other economies um, as well. Um, but that was really uh, a landmark uh, shift. And uh, for the first time did commit China to pretty ambitious uh, reductions in its overall uh, emissions. Uh, and that CO2 pledge was later extended to include all greenhouse gases, uh, making it even more ambitious. But you know, still, if we had been having this discussion uh, immediately after that, I would have, while uh, stressing the unprecedented nature of that commitment, um, also pointed to the fact that China continued to invest in uh, coal-fired power plants uh, at home and especially abroad, and that that was a major uh, source of concern uh, given the rapidly increasing uh, levels of Chinese foreign investment and the role that China was playing in developing infrastructure, uh, including pretty carbon intensive infrastructure across the developing world. Then uh, that takes us to this past September, another speech before the UN uh, General Assembly and Xi Jinping again, uh, somewhat uh, 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 as coming somewhat as a surprise, uh, pledged that China would phase out uh, support for the construction of coal fired power plants uh, overseas. Um, and that is a significant uh, commitment when it comes to reducing uh, China's contribution to climate change uh, abroad as well as at home. Now, there are still lots of caveats, which I'll come back to briefly uh, in a moment. But taken together, um, these different phases, and in, in particular, these two recent commitments do suggest uh, and really indicate, show um, pretty conclusively uh, that climate change and energy issues are really uh, increasingly seen as fundamental uh, to China's overall economic uh, uh, strategy, as well as, again, its foreign uh, policy. And that, in turn, uh, tells us a couple of things um, about some key priorities that China's leaders have uh, and are frankly of relevance even beyond uh, the climate change issue. First of all, they really do see clean technologies and renewable uh, energy industries in particular as key drivers of future economic growth. Second, um, they believe that uh, fundamental industrial restructuring, which has been a priority for China's leaders for some time, moving from a pretty manufacturing uh, heavy uh, resource and pollution intensive economic model to one that looks much more like uh, uh, the US economy, uh, much more services oriented, much higher percentage uh, of uh, consumption uh, as a, a contributor to overall GDP, that that really dovetails pretty well um, with uh, an ambitious climate and energy uh, policy agenda. So they really see uh, kind of economic transformation um, and uh, bending the curve on China's emissions uh, as, uh, as fairly complementary. Uh, the third thing, uh, and I think this kind of links uh, to the uh, China's role in the multilateral uh, negotiations is that China does see uh, climate change as a critical um, symbol of its uh, rise as a great power uh, and of its parity uh, with the United States uh, when it comes to the global stage. Uh, and that that is a message that China is quite keen to emphasize uh, to foreign uh, interlocutors uh, but more importantly, uh, to its own people. Uh, and I would argue that what we've seen is uh, China's uh, kind of uh, role in climate change negotiations 
uh, becoming really the, the go-to symbol um, for China's leaders to say to their own people uh, that China is a great uh, and responsible power uh, on the world stage that is capable um, and willing of tackling big global problems. Um, so again, just I think uh, really uh, increasing centrality uh, both to economic uh, and to foreign policy. Um, now, uh, turning uh, to uh, the US-China kind of piece, um, uh, I would say that that uh, also came uh, primarily as a surprise, the US-China joint declaration that was issued during Glasgow. So really a, a series of, uh, uh, for the most part, pleasant surprises we've seen uh, coming out of, uh, of China when it comes to uh, climate change. Um, although I would say, you know, it was certainly not a surprise that China would play a big role um, in the Glasgow talks. What was a surprise is that in here, the, the declaration was really um, the manifestation um, that uh, there would be a discernible US-China um, uh, kind of uh, tandem that would play a significant role in the Glasgow negotiations. Uh, and obviously the main reason for not thinking that that would be the case is uh, the legacy of, uh, uh, of the past um, four years uh, of kind of broadly cratering US-China relations. Um, and so it really was a striking uh, kind of symbolic act to see that declaration uh, emerge uh, and signal that the two uh, largest economies in the world, um, though increasing competitors uh, in almost every other sphere, uh, were capable of speaking with one voice um, on at least one uh, critical global issue uh, of climate change. More uh, kind of uh, to the point, that declaration signaled uh, that on both sides, Scott, we just lost your audio. I'm sorry, Scott, we just lost your audio. While we, um, while we try and address that here on the back end, um, I'm going to uh, exercise the presider's prerog. Oh, there we are. You're back. So sorry. Uh, not Where's sure it? what happened there. Uh, occupational hazards of Zoom. Almost, uh, almost finished here. Um, but just to say, we did have um, evidence that there was a skeptical camp in uh, Beijing as well as in Washington um, that essentially you could uh, isolate uh, climate cooperation from broader tensions in the relationship. This declaration signals that um, in the short term, um, that uh, it is uh, to some degree possible to do so. But I will say that the two biggest tests of that theory, that it is possible to keep these uh, kind of issues on separate tracks um, is yet to come in the form uh, both of uh, trade uh, and Taiwan. I think those are two of the biggest uh, issues in the broader US-China relationship. Uh, the recent summit uh, signaled uh, a kind of a, an initiation uh, of some new uh, directions in discussing both those issues, uh, but both I think could easily uh, lead to the deterioration of US-China uh, cooperation on climate. I'll stop there. Thanks, I'm glad we were able to sync your audio back up for those, uh, for those closing points, they're important. I'm gonna to turn to the audience questions in just a moment, but Robert, I do, there's folks on the line who pay very close attention to climate related matters, and then there are some who don't pay as close attention to it. So I do kind of want to start by establishing a baseline, and you had mentioned this, the, um, what happened at Glasgow is keeping 1.5 alive, why is 1.5 important? Why is that degree of warming a critical threshold? If you could do that in about 60 or 90 seconds, that would be great. Sure, I, I think there's the scientific answer, but I'm gonna give the, the real person answer. Um, the, the, there is a, a uh, logarithmic difference between uh, change uh, at a 1.5 degree rise to a two and certainly up to three and four degrees. And we're talking Celsius here on all of these. Um, and so it may not sound like much, but these are actually significant uh, changes in, in mean global temperature. Um, the bottom line is that uh, for coastal uh, erosion, the difference between 1.5 and two degrees includes um, the uh, not just significant pressure, but uh, the uh, potential loss of major cities, including Shanghai, London, 
uh, half of Bangladesh, uh, New York City, or at least the lower part of Manhattan. You know, so uh, these temperature differentials really do uh, uh, equate into things like sea level rise. But more generally, the, um, uh, the unpredictability and the violence of, of weather, um, so droughts, fires, all the things we've seen across the American West and in, you know, just literally across the world, um, we're talking about um, uh, significant and uh, um, uh, the, the um, scientific um, projections of the impacts go up astronomically between that 1.5 and 2 degrees. So these are not just numbers that negotiators, you know, hammered out in, in Paris. They're, they're not artificial numbers, basically. Great, thank you. All right, I'm gonna to turn to our first question from the audience. And this is more about how we shift behavior. Uh, you've all mentioned in some way, shape or form how the focus has been mostly on the supply side. But how do we, uh, how, looking at the demand side, how do we shift demand away from stuff that we consume that requires fossil fuels? So Sherry, why don't I turn to you first and then I'll invite brief comments from the other panelists. Well, I, you know, a lot, you know, Rich Kauserlich, who was, um, you know, a long time, uh, very important analyst um, in this space. Thank you, Rich, for joining and for your excellent work over many years. Um, you know, we've often all long talked about energy efficiency as the fourth fuel. Um, and so that, of course, needs to be uh, raised up and integrated again as obvious. Uh, ways to improve and reduce uh, demand. We also need to think about increasingly the nexus of water to power in the equation. And I know Scott is a real expert on this, particularly with respect to China, but that is a growing constraint, for example, on um, water scarcity on power production, particularly within China, which controls the headwaters of most of the major rivers of Asia, like the Mekong. Uh, so I think we have to be um, increasingly concerned about the water scarcity associated with um, certain types of power production and look more towards um, uh, sources such as um, wind and solar that don't require as much uh, water for their power production. But we also have to be, um, I think there, that part of the investment focus um, and the first movers coalition that came out of uh, Glasgow and the focus is also gonna be on reducing demand. Um, but let's be honest, you know, we are a consumption, we're a consumption nation. And no one's saying that the developing world should not achieve their own levels of um, development. Uh, and so they need power. Now they may not need the same types of dirty coal uh, to the extent, you know, we love India to phase out and not just phase down coal, but um, you know, we will see more distributed energy rich, but I, I do think, um, you know, as we as we fast, as we move to more operationalized through better batteries and microgrids and other technologies, uh, the whole clean energy revolution, we also need to see, you know, you've got this conundrum though, because you can move into urban areas and have a lower carbon footprint, but as you move into certain urban areas, the mega cities also are more at risk for various climate impacts. So all of that is to say that it has to be, you know, the solutions, the global solution is great, but the, also the local practical plan is going to be very much um, at, the, at the local level based on each country and within each region. Thanks, Sherry. Scott, uh, what do you think, briefly? Well, uh, I, I guess I can't resist um, uh, sort of uh, uh, underscoring uh, what Sherry said about uh, kind of a, a, a need to focus on um, uh, on water scarcity. I, 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 by sort of background, have have focused actually most intent, intently on uh, water resources, and I sort of have this line that I like to trot out at moments like this, uh, which is that uh, while energy is really the crux of uh, mitigation of climate change, water is really the crux of adaptation to it. Um, and so anytime we uh, uh, think about 
uh, kind of that side of the equation. And it's, it is worth probably also underscoring that, um, you know, not to, uh, uh, you know, uh, in any way minimize the importance of mitigation, but uh, whatever mitigation pathway we end up on, um, we are gonna be adapting to some level of climate change. Um, and so I think uh, building out that part of the equation um, is critically important, um, you know, even though the focus tends to be, the focus and resources sort of, not without reason, tends, tends to be um, drawn more to the mitigation side. But to the extent we, we balance that equation, um, water is really most of the adaptation side of that equation. Well, let me add one more point here, Rich, which is um, I, I think that the, we're going to need to really zero in on agricultural uses of water because that's where so much waste occurs in irrigation. And so many countries from China to many others are so, uh, they're so deeply dependent on agriculture for the, and most of their water use is in agriculture and it's very inefficient. And so when we talk about reducing um, demand, we've really got to, and also we need to transform the agricultural system to make crops more drought resistant. Um, and so all of that, all of that goes together. I see very fascinating technologies in Israel and other places that have, you know, re re improved uh, water use and, and also uh, energy use to produce better agriculture. If we could all do that, um, that we'd be a lot better off. I could just flag uh, the, the role of government policy in affecting demand is, is rather crucial. These things don't just happen in the marketplace. Um, issues around the electrification of the American uh, or the Chinese or the Indian vehicle fleet, um, government policy will determine how rapidly that electrification happens. And you can see in the, the fact that Chinese have used their policy levers to move the electrification of the Chinese uh, uh, fleet much faster than what we're seeing here in the US. And so when we get into policy discussions like Build Back Better or the infrastructure bill in the US, um, making sure that there is a plan for charging stations and for a grid that can handle um, the all types of energy will determine how many people actually end up buying all those cars that GM is touting. Uh, and so, uh, you know, government policy directly affects the uh, scope and scale of the changes in demand for the new technologies that will get us there. Great, thank you. Um, I know that we marketed this conversation as lasting 45 minutes, but if my colleagues on the panel will indulge me in just uh, allowing for a couple of additional questions from the audience, this is a, a fantastic conversation. It's extremely timely and important. The next one I'll pose first to you, Robert. Um, and it's how do we monitor and make sure that uh, this mobilization is not directed into counterproductive greenwashing uh, initiatives to make sure that these pledges are actually met. So toss that to you. Thank you, Pascal, for the question and Patrick for tossing it to me because I wanted this one. <laughs> um, look, the, the greenwashing phenomenon is real. It's out there. It's something we have to, to look for and, and stay on top of on, in all countries, in all sectors. But there are mechanisms and some of the less sexy things agreed in uh, um, uh, in Glasgow that haven't gotten as much attention, the so-called Paris rule book and article six have provisions for um, more transparency in reporting. And there are things happening at the official regime level, climate regime level for ensuring that that transparency in reporting from governments is improved. But simultaneously, there are big moves in um, uh, private sector reporting. Um, the Task Force on uh, Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, or TCFD, is a big deal, and it has been around for years, but it's pick up as voluntary reporting on, uh, on uh, climate-related uh, emissions in uh, decisions by every kind of company. That TCFD framework is getting much broader uh, application. And now we're deep into the discussions at the international level of making mandatory 
financial disclosure, the rule of, rules of the road. And Europe is already well down this path, but the discussions between major players like Europe, the US, Japan, uh, China, about mandatory um, financial disclosure, that would shift markets overnight. And so I think that's a next big piece. There are other pieces that, that affect this. And I would just say, um, you know, Al Gore was in Glasgow talking about, you know, the Planet Lab satellite network to monitor things like deforestation. We are technologically capable to monitor down to the level of individual trees mm -hmm. deforested. So there's no reason to uh, wait for government pronouncements five years after the fact on how they're doing on deforestation. So on a lot of these commitments on deforestation, on the movement of assets, on methane leakages, uh, we need to start applying the technologies and the monitoring system today. It's all there. Great, thank you very much. Uh, since this is lightning round, I'm gonna turn next to uh, the question from uh, Mr. Wall, and I'm gonna direct that to Sherry first. He'd like to discuss what percentage of uh, defense resources go towards uh, greenhouse gas reductions versus resiliency. So if you could shine a light on how, uh, how the department's thinking about this, that would be fantastic. Sure, well, um, you know, the way the defense budget is constructed, you, you have to really look at it in terms of the different accounts of the defense budget. So a lot of our resiliency funding is done through uh, the installations and military construction accounts. That's where we would uh, shore up installations, seawalls, natural infrastructure, uh, change out wastewater treatment plants and power plants, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and, and that's going to continue. And I, I expect that funding will increase, but it's not necessarily coded all as climate resiliency because it, it goes to um, any particular military construction or related infrastructure project incorporating climate resilient standards into it. Um, then uh, second, uh, if you think about, if you, if you wanna think about, um, you know, the, the, then there's weapon systems which are large energy users. And so as the, let's say Air Force and the, the moves to sustainable aviation fuels, you'll see some, you're gonna see investment in research and development to test that out and then to procure those fuels. Again, it, it's hard to, to total up the funds. DOD doesn't always like to do that. It wants to keep some of it disaggregated because uh, sometimes if it's, if it's aggregated a certain way, it becomes a target for reductions. Um, but there is a definite commitment to sort of green the energy systems while maintaining or improving military effectiveness. That goes to um, deploying electric vehicles. DOD procures over 150,000 electric vehicles annually from GSA and is gonna put in charging stations. But also another emphasis for, for next year uh, from the Department of Defense is gonna be on extreme heat impacts on troops. So you're gonna see some investment research and, and readiness investment on the impact on our forces of various climate impacts, particularly heat on troops as they deploy because we have more black flag days now where troops can't train. So, I think across the board, you're gonna see a variety of investments um, and also in manpower uh, at various levels in the services, in the joint staff, in the COCOMs, all across DOD, where you have now, let's say climate, science, climate advisors to every service secretary, you're gonna have climate advisors eventually at every combatant command level and at various echelons below that. So the literacy, climate literacy of the force, now that, that becomes very, um, very important too. So I think, again, we, we have to walk and chew gum. We have to make the, the infrastructure um, and the human infrastructure as well and in DOD and across the board more resilient to the impacts, but we also have to transform our energy and water systems uh, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. The question of whether we're gonna measure and track that, I think that's coming, it's still in the future. The UK is the only military I know of so far that's committed to particular goals, but, but DOD has committed to sort of some net zero goals uh, along the way in line with the president's executive order. So I think you'll see, um, you'll see some targets and metrics coming on that as well. Great, 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to take one more question and I'll pose it to the group and we'll do just a quick round robin addressing the specific question, uh, but also allow you to make any type of closing comment you'd like to make. And I came to Washington uh, to work on Capitol Hill, so I am still a creature of Capitol Hill. So I cannot help but asking you how you see congressional support regarding climate change changing and evolving. Uh, I'd note that there was a bipartisan delegation in Glasgow. So Scott, why don't we start with you and then we'll go to Sherry and then we'll allow Robert to close. Um, yeah, well, thank you, uh, Patrick. And I must say that that's sort of my version of uh, Bob's uh, uh, question I wanted to, I wanted to get. Um, I'll actually uh, maybe just uh, by way of quick, quick framing say that um, I actually participated in a virtual congressional delegation uh, to China, which was a funny experience. Um, uh, focused on climate and energy that took place just before um, the COP. It, it was staff level, not members, but um, it was a very enlightening um, experience, a very bipartisan uh, delegation. Uh, I was sort of you know, serving as a, a, as a resource, occasionally an umpire um, for, uh, for those discussions. Um, you know, the, the thing that I would, uh, um, I would say kind of stepping back uh, and, and again, sort of thinking about uh, the climate negotiations and even the climate issue more generally in the big picture, we need a lot more uh, investment in uh, clean technology research and development. The fact of the matter is um, we don't um, quite have a, a commercially viable pathway at this point to get from, you know, essentially where we are today uh, to where we need to get by the end of the century, particularly in very uh, emissions intensive industries like uh, steel, uh, as well as in the transport sector. Um, and so we need a lot more investment. Um, and uh, a lot of that, though not all of that, needs to come from uh, governments because there is still a, a big chunk of that that's basic uh, research and development. Um, and so we need to find a way to squeeze uh, more money out of governments around the world for this basic, this investment in basic uh, research and development. In the United States, uh, the perceived threat from China um, is a, uh, a way to do that, that has a significant bipartisan appeal. Um, and we've seen that with some proposed legislation, um, none of which has uh, yet uh, been signed into law. Um, and I mean, I have some reservations about the kind of um, hawkishness which frames um, that consensus, but I think there is um, this opportunity uh, at the intersection of China, US foreign policy and climate change uh, to push for some of the investments that we desperately need uh, to tackle this, uh, this crisis. Great, thanks. Sherry, how do you see things shaping up on the Hill? Well, I, I agree with a, a lot of what Scott says. Unfortunately, in our domestic politics, uh, it helps to be able to frame um, you know, an, an adversary and climate is not the adversary right now. China is the adversary, but we do have to walk and chew gum uh, with respect to China. We've got to cooperate where necessary, compete in a race to the top on clean energy. I will note that for quite a while now, uh, the def defense has been a uh, bastion of bipartisan action on climate change and resilience. For the last five years and longer, there have been provisions in the defense bill um, on both supported, you know, and signed by the last president that have required more climate resilience action in the Department of Defense, clean energy systems, more research and development, Arctic preparation strategies across the board. So that is one way, uh, you know, where DOD in certain sectors can lead by example, for example, electric vehicles and charging stations, sustainable aviation fuels. Um, power for remote sectors. I see just today, you know, they're launching, um, and Biden administration's launching a living laboratory of clean energy innovation in the Arctic called Arctic X. Okay, so that's about remote power in Alaska. We've got a lot of military infrastructure in Alaska. Also, it's an important state, you know, so there, there are a variety of ways to do that. And I want to address two of the questions quickly in, in the chat because they were there for a while. I, David Michael from, from Connecticut asked about the oceans. I do think oceans absolutely are critical. Um, you know, we, we project power from the sea. And so we're all about, you know, and the Navy is all about having a healthy ocean in which to operate. And over the last decade since I've been involved has cleaned up its act from stopping dumping in the ocean to protecting marine mammals. And um, now is at the forefront in some ways 
of research and development on what a healthy ocean looks like, including biodiversity. I do think biodiversity, healthy oceans, ecological security is sort of the next chapter in many ways from what we're talking about now, climate insecurity sort of in a broader global biodiversity context. And I do also wanna flag Gopal Reddy's um, comment in here about where's the power gonna come to manage the EV transition in China and India. I'm, I, yes, I share your concern that if it all comes from coal, we really haven't solved much of the problem. And the answers in, in China are not yet obvious as I think um, you and others have noted in your research. Excellent, thank you, Sherry. Robert, any closing comments from you or words of wisdom you'd like to impart to the audience? Yeah, I don't, don't wanna end on a downer, but as much as I would love to say that there are great bipartisan prospects for climate change on the Hill, uh, I'm afraid the, the issue of climate change has been successfully made into a partisan issue by the Republican Party. And I think this is a fact that we have to acknowledge. Um, but as the previous speakers just said, there are key pieces of this equation on which there are bipartisan consensus, consensuses. Um, and I think we just need to uh, disaggregate the, the picture a little bit and, and uh, get bipartisan movement on uh, the grand equation that is economic competitiveness for the United States. We, we can and must mobilize a bipartisan consensus around that. And I think the debates around the climate pieces of the infrastructure package and the climate pieces of the uh, Build Back Better, um, this is something that uh, th there are absolutely coalitions of people on the Hill to move these things, people in both parties that recognize we have to move in this direction. And the China issue and the, the China card, if you will, on this one, uh, is very clear. Competition with China is the order of the day, not just cooperation with China on climate. There is competition with China on climate. And there has to be a bipartisan consensus that if we are going to compete economically uh, with China, we have to uh, invest much more heavily in uh, the R&D all the way to market and in key technologies. So I do think that there is a prospect for bipartisan movement if we disaggregate this a bit and don't wrap it up under a, a climate banner, because that's just too hard for, for the Republican Party in 2021. And I think to just recognize that and, and move pragmatically is probably the order of the day. Scott, Sherry, Robert, thank you all very much for joining us uh, this morning and now into the afternoon. I uh, appreciate your indulgence going, uh, going into extra innings a bit, but we had some great audience engagement, some really fantastic, um, fantastic questions posed, and I greatly appreciate you all taking the time to join us. So with that, everybody, stay well. You too, Patrick. Thank you all. Happy Thanksgiving, Thanks all everyone. Happy, yeah, Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. <laughs>